Um, so my was going to be a little different. I'm going to be looking at the uh, the context of how does an organization move into this new dynamic, new ro new wor rules of working was an excellent topic um, because you probably could not have have, have uh, derived a, a situation that would cause an organization to rethink itself. And that's where we are today. Um, so organizations are trying to figure out what's going to work for us going forward. Everything has been disrupted. You, you've had, you've had uh, organizations have come into this new dynamic and they're trying to figure out whether it's essential workers, or essential workforce, which we think about grocery stores, pharmacies, hospitals have been inundated. I, 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 I'm doing some work with the CEO for a major hospital. And he said the major finding from his side is to try and figure out what's going to happen next. Each day he's been taking notes. He says he has a binder full of notes, insights, as to what they're going to use to try and reconfigure or reimagine the workplace. So my conversation is going to be across three pillars. Is your organization fit for the future? We're also going to talk about reimagining the workplace, which is being done, which was being done prior to COVID. And it's now in kind of full mode. And then we're going to talk about the future of work. And these are conversations, insights that I'm bringing to you from people that I've spoken to, you know, as I said, across the globe. So there's so many disruptors that have come into place today that is shaping the future of work. And as you see here, I have about eight of them listed and I've kind of called these from across, you know, my readings from the major, uh, you know, HR sites, the major consulting firms, which has the money to spend and do all these research. So one of the things I would ask you to do is to go to Deloitte, go to Conferry, go to Accenture, PwC, and register on those sites because you get a chance to read all of their research for free. You get an executive summary. You don't get the full uh, document, but you get enough to understand what's happening outside. So I'm not going to go through each one of these, but Here's what's happening today, and I'll be more than glad to share my slides with, uh, with anyone that wants to get a copy of them. Technology. Um, this is my third call today on some type technological uh, format, a platform. Uh, last week, five days a week was on technology. How are we, how are we going to move forward into this new dynamic? And every organization is trying to understand that. I saw a, a, an interesting job listing uh, last week, director of remote work. And the conversation was around, it was the first time anyone had seen that, but people were trying to figure out who is going to figure out all of this and come back to the organization and say, here's our people plan because I know the audience here is basically made up from HR people, but is our organization going to be fit for the future? And one of the things we've got to do is come out of the bubble that we're in, the HR bubble, and move into the business sector. Do we understand the P&L implications? Do we understand the, something as simple as the revenue for our organization? How much have we lost during this past period? What is going to be the focus? I noted in the grocery industry, um, they were a, a central workforce. They were open every day. Profit shot through the roof. But you know what was the downside to that? Logistics. How do I get products from a warehouse to a grocery store? If you went to your grocery store and you saw there were empty shelves, that's a logistics problem. So organizations that they've been going through strategic workforce planning, they may have realized that maybe logistics wasn't a key driver or a key strategic role but now it is. So all of this, we're gonna to have to figure out. So you see number eight says workforce disruptions, strategic workforce plan, hospitals. The people that were in infectious diseases were top of the food chain now. Whereas some of the other specialists within a hospital, maybe we're not. 
So all of this is coming back and it's coming back into our lap. I've often said that this is probably the most opportune time for human resources to, to enhance their game. You know, we're here to talk about getting a seat at the table and all these kinds of euphemisms. You have to bring something to the table if you're at that table. And that table is centered around business people and business speak, not human resources. It has to be a business approach in trying to move it forward. So let's kind of walk through some implications here. Um, workforce management, strategic workforce planning. I just finished reading an article from McKinsey concerning CEOs upskilling. Now, normally when we think of reskilling, upskilling, we think of the employees. We think of factory workers, maybe our factory is moving to uh, automation, AI, whatever it is. And we always tend to think of other, but you know what? If you're in human resources, you're gonna to have to reskill. You're gonna to have to understand how to complete a workforce planning project. You're gonna to have to become what I call a workforce architect. How do you take a, an organization strategy and you build a workforce around that? That's, a, that's what an architect does. So sometimes, sometimes, well, when I used to travel, I'd always tell people, I said, what do you do? I said, I'm a workforce architect. And that would create a level of conversation, normally with CEOs, if I'm sitting in business class, because they would want to understand the context of a workforce architect. So my thought was, workforce architect, you design the strategy, I take the strategy, I build and align a workforce around that. That's what that's about. That's how the architecture piece works. Everyone is going to have to be reskilled. You hear from a human resource perspective, you're going to have to be reskilled. You're going to have to understand what strategy means. You're going to have to understand the P&L implications of people inside of an organization. This HR stuff that you're doing, if you looked at what I call an issues audit, if you look at one week and look at the amount of time you spend on whatever it is you spend it on, how much of that is aligned to the one, two, three strategic initiatives of the organization? I'm going to tell you now. The vast majority of time, it has no connection. And in order for you to be important in an organization, in order for you to be seen as a business leader, you've got to connect people and you've got to connect it to the uh, strategy of the organization. Leadership and management competencies. The article was talking about CEOs reskilling, upskilling. I think it was upskilling. Reskilling is you have the skill and you're moving uh, forward with that. Managing a virtual team, that's totally different than managing a team in person. The entire organization from a technological perspective is going to have to be reskilled in a new competency centered around managing virtually. For the most part, this is going to be the new normal going forward and there's no way to get around that. Trust, how do we build trust within an organization? Uh, a CEO client of mine told me that on one of his calls, he gave his personal cell number, mobile number, to all of his employees. He says, I don't know the answers, but if you're stressed and you just want to talk, give me a call. We're trying to figure it out together. Building a level of trust. If you build a level of trust, it's just like depositing money in a bank when you need to withdraw you have the funds to withdraw. If you don't build a trust, when you try and draw down on that, you're not going to have it. Leaders are gonna to have to understand that. I had one CEO on a call a couple of weeks ago. He told me that I want this whole thing to stop. I want everybody back into the workplace. I'm not gonna pay anyone to sit and listen to net, watch Netflix every day. And my thought was, you hired these people from a trust perspective, and now you're not trusting them. And by the way, where did you get Netflix from? So from a leadership perspective, that has to be built into their new competency level. How do you build trust within an organization? And that has to cascade down. It can't be just a bunch of words that you're talking through. And every time you have a conversation, you're saying all the right things, but you don't deliver it every day. 
social well-being, well-being, private lives, society as a whole. What's the purpose of what we're doing? I read an interesting article, and you may have seen it also, uh, Life Boy Who Makes Soap closed the factories down. They started making sanitizers. A lot of the design firms stopped what they were doing and started making masks. Is your organization purpose driven? Can you tie into some purpose? People are looking for purpose. If you have a purpose, you may not be the highest paid employer in that region, but you stand for something. And all of these are going to be the new normal for an organization. So we talk about leaders reskilling, we talk about employees reskilling. Well, the organization is going to have to shift to a growth mindset. In other words, I'm concerned about my people and our purpose of being in business is not only to satisfy shareholders, stakeholders, investors, but our people. Richard Branson says, I worry about my people, I take care of them. They will in turn take care of the customers. So the most, probably the most uh, used, overused word today is agile. Agile. Agile is used in every type connotation. But what that means is that this is an agile situation. How do we pivot and rechange our work model? My model before this happened was that, and Sonia knows this, I was on the road possibly three weeks out of the month from Africa to Singapore to Kuala Lumpur uh, to Bangkok. And it was just a consistent loop. And I was home probably for a week. All that's changed. And when we went on lockdown, I went into learning mode and tried to understand how do I operate from this new perspective of this virtual model. Organizations are going to have to do the same thing because it's not going to go away. I, I saw a, a business news article today on, on, on TV and they were talking about the airline industry probably 2022 is that's when they're looking for it to get back to normal. But that's like looking to, into a crystal ball. No one knows. McKenzie, 80% of people question reports that they enjoy working from home. 41% said that they are more productive than they have ever been. And then you have 28% says that they are as productive. Long commutes, no longer travel. I can get up at 7.30 and I can be to work at eight. Whereas if I had to drive a car for a long commute, but my office is not far from my house, so I can get there in 10, 15 minutes anyway. But imagine, I imagine people working in New York City. My New York City commute when I lived in New York was one hour. If I can roll out of bed and go into my office, I've saved 45 minutes. So all of these things are going to change the way that we work and this new work model. And it's going to, the organization is going to have to try and reimagine what is this new workplace going to look like? So I'm reading an article the other day on architecture. And architecture is a very, I don't want to say excited about the implications of COVID because companies are coming to them now and said, how are we going to reimagine workspace? Um, at one time, everybody had to be in the office. So let's say they're not, they, 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 for, from going forward, that maybe we have a 30% model, 30% people come in, or we have some type of hybrid model. How is that going to look? Can we social distance inside of that space? Everyone is trying to figure out if the slates were totally clean and you're starting over from scratch, how are we going to reimagine work and this workplace? Decide people to work or work to people. People coming into work or the work goes to people. So if I can produce from home, why can I why do I need to go through this to come to work? Or maybe my workplace is not conducive to working from home. So what can the organization do to make that palatable? Do I, Google gave uh, all of their employees $1,000, that's Google, um, because they have the money to do that, to spend on any way they wanted to, to enhance their workspace. Whether that be a new chair, whether that be a, 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 a new desk, uh, whatever it is, people in the Philippines have told me, leaders in the Philippines have told me that they're having challenges because of the fact that the internet broadband is very weak. So if someone is on a call, they have to keep the video off because of the fact that if they put the video on and they're talking, 
everything is going to go up. So all of these things, fully remote, hybrid, hybrid remote by exception. So someone told me, in Swiss, one of my clients in Switzerland, we had a call the other day. I said, what's the work schedule for today? She says, I'm working out of the office today. We can only do 30% in the office at, one, at any given time. So I come in two days a week, three days from home. But from a CFO perspective, they're saying, why do I need to have this headquarter concept of five floors when I could possibly get away with one floor? So all of this is changing. Redesigning the workplace, and this is from the architectural perspective that I was talking about. The old model was private offices and you had the cubicles and all these, you had shared amenities and now we're saying, how can we rethink this? You know, you're talking about an agile approach for, for um, architects. They're loving this because of the fact they're getting a chance to really be creative and build a next model of working. How is this footprint going to look, you know, moving forward? Is it going to be a cool space to come into on a hybrid model? Or maybe I just create a cool space and it's used as needed kind of a hybrid model. If I need to come in to have a meeting, I come in maybe once a week and do that. So I'd say all of this has created such an environment that human resources is really, really at no other point in time, you're in the driver's seat. I have an interview coming up next week with uh, Johnny Taylor, who's the CEO from Sherm. And we're gonna talk about these things. We're gonna talk about these things from a licensing perspective. We're gonna talk about these things from a certification perspective. And what do they see as trends with all the research they've done talking about the future of work post COVID? I say post COVID because we don't know when that is. Increase in remote work, 49% of employees are now working remotely versus 30% before pandemic. So what if that was to increase to 60%, 70%? Are we giving thought to that? At one po some point in time, your HR leader is going to have to join the CIO, if the ch chief information officer, chief marketing officer, chief facilities officer, whoever it is, and everyone's gonna have to sit around the table and say, what's the new model? Our expertise is the people side. If we're not equipped to come in on that strategic level, we missed a huge opportunity. So some of our time today should be thinking about and reading everything you possibly can and reskilling, excuse me, reskilling your role as this strategic leader with your expertise being people. Now, the other key point here, I'm seeing a lot of information concerning data collection, software that can track workers. This comes back to, to the Netflix guy. But if I go back to trust, that's alienating everything we just talked about. So 16% of employees are using to monitor employees. My suggestion to that, stay away from it. Use it on a case-by-case -case basis. If you have an employee and you have workers and you can let the KPI be the determinant factor. If they're not delivering, you deal with that on a one-to-one -one case basis. But if you've got a thousand employees and you're investing money for a thousand employees to monitor their activity, you're going about it the wrong way. You're not building trust. You let them know that everyone is an adult. We hired adults. And we're expecting you to abide by that. If there is any type of disruption as it re relates to that, we will have a discussion around it. That's the adult way to do that. But this monitoring people's PCs and, I mean, their laptops or whatever it is to see how that's going to uh, work, that's not a part of this new uh, approach that we're going to be looking at. Contingent workforce is a huge issue today. Do I need full-time people or can I just hire subject matter experts to come in as needed? That's a new kind of derivative that's coming through. And maybe if your organization is, is, is uh, being heavily disrupted along those lines, it's something that you're gonna have to uh, become a student of. 
one of the other things that I talk about a lot is that we're going to have to become a student of the new world of working. If you're in human resources, you're going to have to read more. You're going to have to stay in learning mode because this thing is moving so fast that you can't sit back and be process driven 90% of your time. Issues audit. What do you spend the most time on in a week? If you were to keep a diary and calculate the amount of time you spend on whatever, <clears throat> whatever you're doing, is it aligned to strategic issues or challenges within the organization or you're just doing work? Well, I got to tell you this, you need to move beyond that and try and understand what are the organization's pain point? If you're an HR BP model, what is that client's major challenge? And your role is to fix that. Your role is to fix that. Your role is not in the new realm of human resources with this process stuff. General Electric automated 85% of their processes in India, G GE Healthcare. So what does that mean if you were a process expert? Goes here, step here, and, and goes over to here. What they decided to do was to pull back with the cost savings and they upskill their entire workforce to become a true HR business partner. And being an HR business partner is more than just a job you're doing. You have to understand the concept and the way that Dave, Dave Aldrich designed that. That was based on building a competency level of an HR expert as a problem solver, solution provider, not as a process expert. Critical skills and roles. Um, this is what I'm talking about with you. What are you doing to upskill yourself? Because you're going to have to, there's no way to get around it. There's, you look at a factory worker and you're concerned about factory workers and upskilling or reskilling. Well, you know what? You're the same. We're all in the same boat. And you're going to have to spend some time trying to figure out what's next for me. Employees as workers. Um, dehumanization of the workforce, people, employees as people versus employees as workers. Trust. Um, everyone's going through a lot, listening more. And having a workforce or a workforce that understands that their employee has their best interests at heart. So the organization is going to have to have to switch from this hard skills kind of, and in the same mode of everyone else we've been talking about and upskill, upskill to a growth mindset. How do I take care of my employees? How do I reskill them? How do I, how do I give them new skills for this new level of work? I don't know whether you read that, that there was an interesting article that came out of, of last year. Amazon um, automated all of their logistics warehouses with robots. They did a hybrid model, but they set aside $700 million to train 120,000 workers to give them new skills. Humanization of the workforce. Because if they were to go to fully robotics, the same way that Alibaba is in China, you don't need workers to run the warehouse anymore. Anything that's process driven, you can automate. It's as simple as that. So if you're in HR and you're process driven, you can automate that. And it's only a matter of time. So you really don't have any cho other choice but to try and automate or upskill yourselves. Um, the other one emerges of top tier employees, grocery chain. All of a sudden, here's the logistics was the key piece. It wasn't the buyers, it wasn't the stores. How do I get product from the warehouse to the store? And this was a CEO who gave their employees his personal mobile number. Nobody call, but think of the message that sent as we talk about humanization of workers. Employees felt that their leader cared about them. Something as simple as that. He gave them the phone number and people said, oh no, don't give them the phone number. He said, I don't care. Let them call me. Call me any time of the night. No one called. But the communication message that he sent out, sent out told the whole story. And then closing, transitioning um, 
organizational, uh, uh, we're going to have to possibly do some probable changes and right sizing the workforce, organizational redesign, workflows, all those kinds of things. Logistics companies are realizing we're in the driver's seat now. How do we redesign? How does an organization going to redesign? If, we, if you're still using the same org chart, which was designed, by the way, by Henry Ford, 1800s, and it's basically the same, horizontal, vertical, which does not give you a true picture of what's going on inside. That may have to be redesigned. For someone in human resources, I had a prior role as the vice president of human resources that my specialty was org design at Martha Stewart back in the early 2000. Um, yeah, I was there when she went to jail. Um, but it was so intriguing trying to figure out, as I look at this now, how do you redesign the organization? How do you redesign and build a more robust workflow within an organization? It's a specialty. Become an expert at it if you're interested in that. In that. All of this has brought about organizational complexity. Every business unit is trying to figure out how is this thing going to work? But you know what? In the end, it comes back to all of you on the call. How are you going to make your organization fit for the future? So it's up to us. Uh, all my calls are dealing with this, making organizations fit for the future. And it's something that we're all going to have to think about. And we're all going to have to reskill and we're all going to have to think about what our role is going to look like in a future scenario five years out what is it going to look like so with that i thank you and uh sonia